Welcome to the Cyber Center for Biblical Studies. Hi, my name is Herb Bateman. This is the second of a four-part video series of a conference held in 2014. The conference was Let's Know the Bible. The speaker is Tim Sprankle, pastor of Leesburg Grace Brethren Church. He will speak today on God's past story. Once again, he will be referencing a booklet, a conference booklet throughout his presentation, available on Amazon. In fact, that's actually the first part of Genesis. What's Genesis about? What's the major subject of the book of Genesis? It's beginnings. It's beginnings. Genesis is a book filled with beginnings. We get to look at the first people. We get to look at the first place. Adam and Eve. Real people situated in a real place. The Garden of Eden. We get to look at the first problem. We call it sin in our theological circles, but you know what else it is? It's rebellion against their divine king who created them. Rebellion, first problem. And we get to see God's first solutions. When God saw that the world was so wicked that he needed to start again, he came up with a solution. He found a righteous Noah and gave him plans for an ark. And yet the world continued to sin in the story of Babel. And so he said, I need to call someone to start a nation. And he calls Abraham. So we have Abraham covenant. It's a book of beginnings. Now, believe it or not, Genesis was not written to 21st century materialistic, individualistic Americans. I know that's hard to believe, but a lot of times we treat Genesis like it was written to 21st century materialistic Americans. Moses wrote the book. If you're looking along in your notes, you can see different references in Scripture where Moses is attributed as the author of this book. Now, if Moses is writing the book of Genesis, Moses is writing to a particular people in a particular place. And we don't actually know where that place is because it was probably the Exodus generation wandering somewhere in the wilderness. Maybe he gets part of his revelation on Mount Sinai. Uh, maybe he writes it during one of the stalled points during the 40 years of wilderness wandering. We don't know exactly when and where. But we know that Moses wrote Genesis to the Exodus generation. And it tells them their unique place in the plan and purposes of God. This is important because these are the kind of questions that that Moses is dealing with when he addresses these people. Now, let's think about this. Why did Moses write Genesis to the Exodus generation wandering in the wilderness? Not 21st century materialistic, individualistic Americans. Well, here's why. Moses is fighting against idolatrous worldview of the ancient Near Eastern peoples. What Genesis does is it counteracts the mythology of Egypt and Canaan with the history of of Israel's beginnings. In fact, there's a song. It's not in your hymn book because it's been updated, but the original version goes like this. I have decided to follow Moses. I have decided to follow Moses. Canaan before me, Egypt behind me. No turning back, no turning back. In the rearview mirror of Israel's past, they have the idols of Egypt, gods like Ptah or Ra. In the future, on the horizon, they have Baal and Dagon and other idols of Canaan. They're living in a world where idols are in the back and in the front, and they worship the one true God, Yahweh. And Moses wants to prepare them to overcome their past and look forward to the future. And this is important. In fact, if you look in your notes, I, you'll see that I have some references to the way that the ancient Near Eastern people talked about their gods. They talked about their gods not in history, in mythology. Genesis is history. It's filled with names and peoples and places and actual events. And our God invaded history. He actually called it into existence. The ancient Near Eastern people, they came up with stories of how the world came into being. They talked about gods creating the worlds. A lot of times, though, it was gods fighting each other. The strongest god won, cut up the, the god that lost, and then their bodies and parts and blood formed the earth. But in Egypt, the gods spoke the world into existence. There were many gods. It's important for us to know this. When we look at the book of Genesis, 
Moses is counteracting some of these myths. Moses is fighting against Egypt behind me and Canaan before me. You can see that they even have stories of a universal flood. What's different about the Bible is that God gave the plans for the ark. And God wasn't going to send a flood because he was tired of people like the gods of the ancient Near Eastern worlds. They make too much noise, those gods thought. They're kind of annoying. And I agree, sometimes we are, and sometimes we do. But that's not a reason to destroy us all. But God saw that our hearts were continually bent on evil. And so he wanted to start clean. But he gives Noah, the righteous man, plans for an ark. He wants to rescue him out of there. So you can see that when you compare the Bible to the literature of the area and place and time in which the Bible was written, the Bible is telling a dramatically different story about one sovereign God who loves his creation, called it into existence, and wants to rescue us from our own rebellion. That's important to know. What's the message, then, that Moses gives to the Exodus generation? If you're taking notes here, you can write this down. Moses traces Israel's family history back to her earliest beginnings. How early? The very beginning. In the beginning, God created. So that the people of God understand his good creation, sin's devastating consequence, and the blessed work of redemption through the covenant with Abraham. His good creation sin's devastating consequences, and God's blessed work of redemption. Remember that kingdom redemption program through the covenant with Abram. Now, you're going to note today that I keep going back and forth between Abram and Abraham. I can't get it straight, and the Bible, you know, starts with Abram and then gets to Abraham, so forgive me if I continue to do that, but I notice when I've practiced, and every once in a while I practice what I'm going to preach, that I, I say um, the wrong things there. So going along with our notes, uh, if you want a, a key verse to the book of Genesis, it's this. It's Genesis 12, 1 through 3. And Herb read this to us, but I'm going to read it again. Now the Lord said to Abram, go out from your country, your relatives, your father's household, to the land that I will show you. Then I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great so that you will exemplify divine blessings. I will bless those who bless you. But the one who treats you lightly, I must curse. And all the families of the earth will bless one another by your name. God's solution to the disruption? Abraham. In fact, if you go through your notes, you're going to find that I have this particular covenant promise to Abraham laid out in the four different places where God spoke to Abraham. God didn't tell Abraham everything from the first moment, at least not the way it's recorded in Genesis. He sort of progressively revealed this to Abraham. So in chapter 15, you get to see this covenant with a little more detail. The Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land. They will be enslaved and oppressed for 400 years. Now as a Hebrew person who's just coming out of slavery in Egypt, you say, Aha, that's why we've been there. And maybe they've heard the story told. But when they see it in writing, Aha, we were in Egypt because it was part of God's plan and promise. We were supposed to be there. In fact, you can see how this covenant develops. Abraham believes in God's house of righteousness. The covenant was cut and consumed. In that story in chapter 15, Abraham actually cuts an animal and God passes through. It's this beautiful scene of God wanting to seal the deal with Abraham. There was a promise of exile for 400 years and then land promised to Israel, or God's people. 400 year period. Why? So that the sins of the Amorites, people living in Canaan at the time, could get to their fullest, stinkiest level. And then God could have Israel come in and clean them out, which they didn't do. In chapter 17, we have this covenant move forward a little bit more. No longer will your name be Abram. Instead, it will be Abraham. So from this point forward, I should call him Abraham. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you extremely fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will descend from you. Development of this covenant. Kings will come from you. God changes Abram's name to Abraham. Circumcision in chapter 17 is a sign of the covenant, and God predicts royalty in Abraham's family line. You get to see this covenant one more time in chapter 22 after God asks Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. And when God then rescues Abraham, when he sees that Abraham is willing to give up and willing to trust God enough to give up his son Isaac on the altar, then God says, stop, take the ram, 
I solemnly swear by my own name, decrees of the Lord, that because you have done this and not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed bless you. I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be countless as the stars in the sky or the grains on the sands of the sea. Key words throughout the book of Genesis include bless, multiply, seed, good, evil, curse. You can see I have a list of those in your notes. Abraham here offers Isaac. God provides a ram. God swears an oath to confirm his promise. And the blessing to the nation is reiterated. Now also, if you look in your notes, I have a little quote here that I'd like to read. It's actually in this book over here on the IVP today, The Mission of God. It says, reflecting on the life of Abraham, no leaving, no blessing. Put bluntly, if Abraham had not got up and left for Canaan, the story would have ended right there, or with an endless recycling of the fate of the Bible. The Bible would be a very thin book indeed. We're here this morning because Abraham went when God called him. And we're here this morning not only because Abraham trusted and obeyed God, but because God is true to his word and keeps his promises. The book of Genesis sets us up for these promises to Abraham. And then if we look at the flow of this book, we get to see how does Abraham's life continue forward in the people of God. So I want to take you through the flow of this book. There's really two sections to the book of Genesis. There's the primeval history, and that's a fancy word for the old history. And then there's the patriarchal history. And the patriarchal history takes us through the different family of Abraham. So it's stories of people. And we know some of these stories well. In the primeval history, we get the creation of Eden, Icos, that's a fancy way of saying the image of God and man, and everything else. We also have the fall of humankind and the curse on creation. And then we have the fallout of humankind from fratricide, the story of Cain and Abel, to Babel, where people wanted to make a name for themselves to become great. And instead of being fruitful and multiplying, they centralized when God asked them to scatter it. So there's sin all throughout these chapters 4 through 11. But then God sends Abraham away and starts this, this solution. In the patriarch history, we get to see Abraham called and confirmed as the father of promise. We get to see Jacob blessed and as the bearer of the birthrights. We get to see Joseph exalt, exiled by his brothers and exalted as a steward in Egypt. And if you're like me and you grew up in the church, you're probably envisioning flannel, flannel graphs right now with some of these stories. And there's classic tales here in the Old Testament. What's interesting, though, is a lot of times when we talk about Genesis nowadays, we focus on the primeval history. And really, the bulk of Genesis is on the patriarchal history. It's telling us God's solution through the covenant to Abraham. There are other people, too. Remember, Abraham was going to bless all the nations, and, and there were offsprings. It's a story of family lines. And so we get to see Abraham's other offspring, Ishmael. And we get to see Jacob's brother, Isaac's other offspring, Esau. And he's covered in some detail. And we also get to see Jacob's other offspring, Joseph's brother, Judah, who, in fact, is actually the more important character in the book of Genesis. He's the more important character because it's through him that a royal line is promised. And the promise of a king eventually comes through Judah. So that's the flow of this, but if we're to sit down and, and think about what does Genesis teach us today? What are the particulars? How can I walk away and feel like there's something to gain from Genesis? Uh, we have to understand that God's creative intent is all over the book of Genesis. He opens up as the creator, he's the sustainer, and this is a theme that's carried on throughout the rest of the, the Old Testament. God in Genesis chapter 1 creates things, and creation is cited as good. In fact, it's cited as blessed. God said, let there be. God saw that it was good. Seven times in the book of Genesis, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good. I don't know about you, but I'm a very optimistic person. I'm a very positive person. I see a day like this, and I'm like, man, I want to be outside. I love the smell of fall when the leaves come off the trees, and people are throwing footballs, and kids are playing soccer, and campfires, and everything about creation this time of year excites me. I see the goodness 
situation. I really do. A week ago, a week ago, I was at Glacier National Park, climbing in mountains. Beautiful out there. I can see the goodness of God in creation. Later in the Bible, it says that all creation gets to see a witness of God through creation. In fact, in the Psalms, the psalmists know that creation is so good that they write things like this. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth is handy. Man, creation is good, and it's a good representative of God and his glory. And Genesis tells us that. It gives us a reason to celebrate God and the goodness of creation. It also gives us reason to look at people around us and say, every person created has dignity. Every single person. Do an exercise with me. Look to the person next to you. Smile at them. <laughs> you just looked at an image bearer. You just looked at someone who represents God better than a tree, a fish, a plant, a flower. You look at, at someone who represents God better than a, a movie, better than a rock. You look at an image bearer. And what it tells us in the book of Genesis is that everyone created is created in God's image. We shouldn't speak poorly of other people. We should celebrate other people. We are image bearers. This is great news. Uh, Jeremy mentioned that he uh, has adopted three children. Or he mentioned a couple from uh, two boys from China. My wife and I are in the process of adopting a boy from Ethiopia, and he has special needs. And I'll tell you what, that is absolutely frightening to me. I don't know what we're getting ourselves into. Except I know this. We are adopting an image bearer. And what defines him is not his special needs, but the fact that he is stamped with the mark of God. <coughs> Genesis tells us that. Now, I'm positive. But I'm also realistic. And so when we talk about people being created in the image of God, we also need to look at Genesis and say that uh, there's a rebellious bent. There's a curse on creation. There are bad things. So sure, I look up at the stars at Glacier, and I think, wow, they are beautiful. And some mornings I wake up and walk out of my house on Main Street here in Warsaw, and I look at the smog from Dalton, and I think, ew. <laughs> Because we live in a cursed and fallen world. A world where the curse has affected everything. And sometimes I wake up and the rush of the day and the chance, the fact that I haven't gotten to my routine gets me a little fussy and makes me short with people. And you know what? When I look in the mirror later that morning, I think, why am I so selfish and petty and needy? And the book of Genesis tells us that this is the plight of humanity. Um, all of creation has been affected by the curse. When man rebelled against God, he cursed the serpent. He told the woman that childbearing would, would have increased pain. He also told Adam that the grounds were going to produce thorns and thistles because of our rebellion. The curse is comprehensive. It affects all of life. So yeah, I'm, a, I'm, I'm an optimist. I see the stars and the beauty of creation. I also <coughs> see the smog and the sickness in my heart. And I know that people are image bearers, but I also know that my kids don't always like to listen to what I do. I know that people text when I'm talking in church, and that's a sin. Did you know that's a sin? <laughs> <laughs> that's a sin. You should listen to what the preacher says, right? Now, there's this gravitational pull of disobedience that the book of Genesis tells us about. And this is the most tragic place, Genesis 6, 5. The Lord saw the wickedness of human kind. It had become great on the earth. Every inclination of the thoughts and their minds was only evil all the time. But let me be optimistic again. There is an enduring goodness in God. And one of the places that we see this is that God has planted us. And we see this from the beginning of Genesis in families. Families that sometimes there will be sibling rivalries that lead to death. Or throwing a brother like Joseph into slavery. But other times sibling rivalry in these families that we live in, or church communities that we live in, or friendships that we have, mean that we have the opportunity to show forgiveness to one another. And one of the ways that we experience God's enduring goodness is we get to show forgiveness to each other. And we get to see this in the life of Joseph, who says, their father was dead. When he saw his brother, when the brothers saw that their father was dead, what if Joseph bears a grudge and wants to repay us in full for all the harm we did to him? So they sent word to Joseph saying, your father gave these instructions before he died. Tell Joseph this. Please forgive the sins of your brothers and the wrong they did when they treated you so badly. Now please forgive the sins of the servants of God your father. 
But Joseph answered them, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? And none of us is. None of us is. As for you, you meant harm to me, but God intended it for a good purpose. So he could preserve the lives of many people. And you can see this day. So now, don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your little children. Then he consoles them and spoke kindly to them. And this is the way the book of Genesis closes. With Abraham's family exiled in Egypt, but blessing the nations, and the family where there was strife, we get to see the beginnings of reconciliation because God's goodness is evident in the way we treat each other as image bearers, as brothers and sisters who forgive one another. So there's a lot to learn from the book of Genesis. It's really a beautiful book. And uh, I have a commentator who actually, their book is over here at the Kriegel table. It says, in Genesis, Yahweh's grace is bound up extensively with the sovereignty. As we've seen, Genesis 50-20 highlights Yahweh's sovereignty. As Joseph notes, God was able to turn the evil inclinations of his brothers into good so that the people were preserved alive. Now we've got to move forward into the story of Samuel. I'm doing first and second Samuel. Originally when the, the Hebrew version of Samuel was written, it was in one scroll. So in the Hebrew Bible it was treated as one text, but we in our Bibles have first and second Samuel. I'm covering them both and we're going to be rapid fast here. This is about kingship. Kingship for the people of God. And we know that that was an important story, an important desire. We see kingship was talked about way back in Genesis when Judah was told that he would have a royal heir. We also see kingship talked about in the prophecy of Balaam, that you are going to have a star rising out of your people. In Deuteronomy, in the Mosaic Law, it made conditions for a king. Even in the book of Judges, with Gideon, the people cried out and said, won't you be our king? Not a neighbor, our king. And... He declines, but then we get into Samuel, and we have not only in Hannah's song in chapter 2 a prayer for a king, but we have the people clamoring for a king. So the people, God's people, Israel, expected and wanted a king, was set up so they were looking forward to a king. We don't know who wrote Samuel. Uh, we know Samuel at least started it, but he died before it was done, so we can't say Samuel wrote the whole book. Um, we don't know when it was finished, but probably after the divided monarchy, because what it does is focuses on King David as the real promise bearer in God's line. And it was written to trace the monarchy to its roots and highlight the ideal King David. So if you're taking notes, we don't know who wrote it, we don't know exactly when it was finished, but Samuel got it started, and it was, it was finished so that people could look to David as the ideal king. And what's the message here? The message is that Samuel focuses on God's chosen King David so that the people of God will continue to trust God's promise for a royal heir and continue to obey his word. They want to trust God's promise and obey his word. Unfortunately, God continues to give people like Samuel, prophets, to God's people so they can hear God's word preached and the prophets challenge us to obey Trust and obey. Key verse for Samuel is chapter 7, and Herb read this earlier, so I'm going to skip through this a little bit, but point out some of the key words. This is the promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7, that you're going to have a royal heir, you're going to have a son, he's going to establish a kingdom, and then I will love him with loyal love. Your house and your kingdom will stand before me permanently. Your dynasty will be permanent. Not only did this promise in 2 Samuel 7 make an impression on David as he passed it down to Solomon, but it made an impression on the worshipers of Israel. Because if you look through the Psalms, you'll see this promise to David referenced numerous times, and I have this in your notes. The promise of a royal son. The promise of a permanent kingdom. The promise of royal love. And there's other notable royal psalms. Part of the worship of Israel was calling out for God to keep his promises to King David. And so we see this in a lot of Psalms. Here's the flow of Samuel. We get to see it, the prophetic ministry of Samuel. And there's a king that the people await. They're waiting for a king. You see Hannah pray about it. You see the sons of Eli falling apart. The people say, this leadership plan is not going to work. You get to see the sons of Samuel fall apart, and they say, this leadership plan is not going to work. So in chapter 8, they demand a king. Unfortunately, the king disobeys God, and he's rejected by God. Or maybe that's fortunate, because we get a better king. We have the conflicted kingdom of Saul, 
once he's replaced by David in chapter 16, and then his kingdom starts to get unraveled in chapters 17 through 31. We have all these stories about the people of Israel saying, David killed 10,000, Saul killed thousands, and Saul gets jealous and he throws spears and chases after David. He unravels. At the end of chapter 31, he dies. And so we have a mighty king rising in Judah. Again, at the beginning of 2 Samuel, we get a reflection on Saul's death and David taken from Judah. And then he's the mighty king who rises in all of Israel. Unfortunately, this mighty king in 10 to 19, in 10 to 20 falls. Even David sins, that gravitational pull of disobedience. So we have the last part, a song and a census, reflections on King David. Now, I know we went pretty fast through here, but looking at 1st and 2nd Samuel and asking what are key takeaways for us today, I look at these particulars. God demands obedience. He demanded obedience from Adam and Eve. He demanded obedience from Moses and the Exodus generation. He demanded obedience from Samuel and Saul and David and Israel's kings and prophets. He demands obedience for us today. The demand for obedience is great. We get to see all sorts of examples of disobedience and how it's painful in the book of 1st and 2nd Samuel. Eli's sons disobey. Israel disobeys God, goes into battle with the ark, and they end up losing the ark. Saul disobeys God with the sheep that he didn't slaughter and the king that he didn't kill. They were supposed to wipe out the Amorites. And David disobeys God in his sin with Bathsheba and having Uriah the Hittite killed. In fact, two of the most famous lines in Scripture are, what's this sound of sheep I hear in my ears and the sound of cattle that I hear? And what that is is Samuel, when he's confronting Saul about his disobedience, Saul's like, I didn't do anything wrong. And then he hears a, meh, meh. So what's the sound of sheep that I hear? Great line that parents can use with their kids. What's this line of sheep that I hear? The other one is when David is confronted with his sin with Bathsheba by form of a story. Nathan the prophet says, here's this guy who's in power who did this thing to this other guy who had no power and really oppressed him and abused him. And David goes, that man should be killed! And the response from Nathan is, you are that man. Try that one when you're preaching on Sunday. You are that man. Uh, examples of disobedience abound. And, and God wants us to be obedient in the little matters and in the big matters. Obedience is really important. In fact, he looks at our hearts. It's not just about surface issues. He says, it's not just about looking obedience, about being obedient. Does the Lord take pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices? This is Samuel talking. As much as he does in obedience, certainly obedience is better than sacrifice. Paying attention is better than the fat of rams. This is a scary part of following God and Jesus, is that we can show up to church on Sunday, smile, look good. We can come to a conference on Saturday, smile, look good. Everything's fine, and God looks to our hearts, and he knows if we're being obedient or not. And he has dethroned kings because of it. There's also a man's uh, propensity to oppress. We get to see this in the story of Saul and David, but there's more examples. Goliath oppresses Israel. And he mocks God. Saul hunts David. David kills Uriah. And then there's a story at the end of 2 Samuel about Ziba, a servant of Mephibosheth, who takes advantage of Mephibosheth and tries to get his land and his possessions. There's oppression all around in the stories of Samuel. And God doesn't like it. God doesn't care for the oppression. And so what we have in this period of time is David, as he's being oppressed by Saul, he's running off into the wilderness, or even by his son Absalom, he's hiding out, and he uses this as a time to reflect on how he experiences oppression, and how God sees him when he's experiencing oppression. And I know we all feel it, whether it's from neighbors, extended family members, whether it's in the workplace, we have felt oppressed, maybe just in general being a Christian, although we don't face it as much in our nation as they do in other places. How do we respond to this oppression? Davis gives, Dave, David gives us texts for this, like Psalm 3. Lord, how numerous are my enemies. Many attack me. Many say about me, God will not deliver him. Salam. Now I want you to read these two lines with me. 
Rise up, Lord my God. Deliver me, my God. That's a lament song. So the way that David wanted us to read this is, Rise up, Lord! Deliver me, my God! Yes, you will strike my enemies on the jaw. You will break the teeth of the wicked. The Lord delivers. You show favor to your people. The Bible is not afraid of emotion. David was being oppressed for much of his life. And he cried out to God. I rest and I slept. I awoke for the Lord protects me. I am not afraid of the multitude of people who attack me from all directions. Read this with me. But you, Lord, are a shield that protects me. You are my glory and the one who restores me. To the Lord I cried out. And he answered me from my holy hill. His holy hill. The book of Samuel gives us an opportunity at how to face oppression. We oppress people. We are oppressed. And the lament psalms, and there are many of them, give us a, the language for facing oppression. Psalms of lament call on God to stop injustice, exploitation, and oppression by calling on God to intervene. The psalmist, or the one praying the psalms, is affirming that God is the utterly fair and all-knowing judge. To those suffering, such laments are a message of hope. God will not let the wicked get away with it forever. And here's many examples. I have these in your notes, so I'll skip ahead to this last one. God's discernment of character. Last thing in the book of Samuel, God is able to see people like Hannah who cry out. He hears Hannah's cry, and he sees David's heart. Hannah, you know, at the beginning of 1 Samuel, or maybe you don't know, she was sad because she couldn't have a baby. And to be infertile in those days was very difficult. It was shame. To be infertile in our days is difficult, too. And so she cries out to God. She's very upset as she prays to the Lord. She was weeping uncontrollably. Now Hannah was speaking from her heart. I poured out my soul to the Lord. And so, again, over here on the Kriegel table, we have someone reflecting on the life of Hannah. She cried out to God. And because God discerns character, and we see this throughout Samuel, we can trust that God hears. Hannah's commitment to the Lord was the catalyst for revival of genuine Yahweh worship through the spiritual leadership of her son, Samuel. And I see this in emails around um, from ministerial meetings in our, in our, not only in Warsaw, but in our nation. We need revival. Right? We need revival in our nation. You know where revival starts? It doesn't start from the fiery pulpit. It doesn't start from the king's throne. What the book of Samuel teaches us is revival starts from someone like Hannah, who knows that God hears her and is willing to cry out, Oh my God, will you fix this situation? Thank you for watching. Our next video focuses on God's current story and an emphasis on the books of Matthew and Romans. I hope you will enjoy that.